Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 72nd New Social Environment. I'm Sophia, the Managing Director here, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between our publisher, Fong H. Bui, and Max Holein, the Director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We're also thrilled to have Rail board member Helen Lee with us today to close our event with a poem. Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprising unfolding across the country, following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDodd, Nina Pop, David McCatty, James Scurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Rashard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Torian Salo, and so many others that we don't have the names of. And in response to generations of structural violence against Black communities, Black Lives Matter, and we will continue to support ongoing action in the struggle for racial justice. Before I introduce our host and guests, please join me for a brief moment of silence. And now to introduce today's host. Fong Bui is an artist, writer, independent curator, publisher, and artistic director of the Brooklyn Rail, the River Rail, Rail Editions, and Rail Curatorial Projects. Max Holine was appointed director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in April 2018 and is responsible for guiding the museum's artistic vision and all of its programming, research, and collection initiatives. An accomplished director for 20 years, Holine oversees the Met's curatorial, conservation, and scientific departments, exhibition and acquisition activities, education and public outreach, as well as the libraries, digital projects, publications, imaging, and design. And with that, over to Fong Bui. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I just realized that Max and I are both immigrants. One is from the, the West and one from the East. So delighted. I, must, I want to say that ever since Max um, and Nina, his amazing partner, along with their three children, moved to New York City from San Francisco to be the new director of our most beloved museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, in April, as you mentioned, 2018. Max and I met several times in our mutual sociability in passing, but never really quite had a lengthy conversation as we're about to welcome one now, especially during this profound significant time when both the pandemic and the ongoing protests against systematic racism, um, since the late 60s, wherever that been kept under the carpet, the rug, for so long, at least in the late 60s, when the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, and against the protest against the war in Vietnam brought us together, you know, on the street protesting. But when the war in Vietnam ended in 75, it seems so many incredible intellectuals, left it intellectual, moved to the academy, and the next several generations were to be remain there. So therefore the hermetic practice became even more amplified, hence losing the discourse of any national politics. You know, it's a balloon theory. You squeeze the air here, it goes somewhere, and it could only sustain for so long, the skin will break, and it did break. It did break, and it's out in the open, in the fullest visibility, but we also know what we must do in that ideology simply divide us, why dreams and anguish bring us together. So welcome to our new 73 episode, Max. Happy that you can join us today. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to see at least some of you and to have a, an hour to chat together and talk about what's going on in the world here in New York and of course also at the Met. I should also mention Max also and I are uh, Instagram friends. He opened his account only a week or 10 days ago. So he posts one of himself walking through the empty galleries um, in the Met because he lives not far from the museum. So he takes daily walk to his office and he posts one that was very moving in the empty spaces. So my first question to you, um, is that how, how are you coping, adjusting, Max? The, the, the walk, the daily walk must allow you so much self-reflection, thinking what's happening. Well, I think we, are, we all kind of have the same uh, situation in a way that we, we are coping and we are thinking, and I think we are also reflecting on how 
can we best not only deal with, with, the, with the current situation, but actually how can we use the current moment to use it as a positive energy and use it to move forward as an institution, understanding though that these are very challenging times, uh, challenging on, on various levels. Um, and also there are times for reflection and also times of not only learning, but addressing issues that we haven't really fully addressed for sure. And it's also a kind of a, a moment of reckoning. So I think that's, there are no, numerous things that go through your head. And I think they, they also, of course, I mean, again, we've experienced that they, they changed. Like when we, when we closed on, I think it was uh, March 13, um, mm -hmm. And then I continue to come to the museum almost every day. We have a small group of uh, like core staff working there, making sure that the, the building is safe and secure. We have custodial people there, uh, or people working on our facilities. And I just felt it's important to, of course, also be at the institution, also thank the people who are working there right now uh, for their, yeah, just really also their commitment and uh, coming to the museum at a time where it's uh, certainly is also challenging coming there. So for me, it's easy, of course, I, I walk to work, but others can't. And so I think that there is another nuance to that. Um, so for me, of course, thinking about that, when you walk to work and then through the, through the empty mat, you have a lot of different uh, thoughts, depending also on what time frame or what's currently going on. I think our biggest, or let me put it this way, I would say at the beginning of our time of closure, I thought this is a, pro this is a moment that will be like a month or so, uh, something like that. And then we will be able to reopen and everything will be kind of immediately as it has always been. Obviously that kind of changed uh, in regard to our, how we look into the future, but also in regard to the timeline. And also I think what changed were also the, the sets of priorities that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, as an institution at this current time and re realizing that some of these priorities are even conflict with each other. So yeah. I, I think part of our task currently is almost like find a solution to an equation that has several variables where some of the variables might not even be properly uh, be placed in the same equation. So to yeah. give you an example of that, I. Uh, our, part, like our, our goal from the very beginning uh, was to make sure like that safety of our staff and of our audience comes first. And that, that's the reason why we closed as the, med, as the first major cultural institution in New York. We knew that that would have a- The director effect. of the Met. Um, and but it's, it's some, something that we, we really uh, uh, said, no, we have to kind of go in that direction. Now, obviously, now that we get prepared for are we preparing for reopening, we have to balance the question of, we want to make sure that we reopen, of course, only at the moment or at a time and in, in circumstances that, that are as safe as possible for our staff and for our visitors. But of mm -hmm. course, you need to balance that right now. And that's what we're currently doing. And we are planning to reopen on August 29th. So we are still some time uh, um, until then, because we feel we want to, make sure that we are not only as prepared as possible, but we can also really properly work and communicate with the staff who needs to come back for that uh, mm -hmm. so that everybody feels uh, uh, fine. And I just one side note to that, the, the big issue in regard to that is not only the safety in the building. I think we can be fairly prepared for that, but the big bottleneck almost, as we all know, is public transportation and our uh, staff and visitors coming here. So I think that there's a challenge and a, and a nuance there that we have to uh, adjust. Um, we also want to, of course, always reach and outreach a, a broadest possible audience. But we now know when we're opening, we have to almost like probably restrict access. Uh, and yeah. I'm concerned even that I would see that our audience in the next couple of months might be super local. We know our audience is going to be local, which I think can be a great advantage. It means kind of an audience that we are, we are in continuous touch with. So less tourists, more local audience. But let's say if people don't feel comfortable using public transportation, it could be a very local audience. And that's obviously not really the idea of, of the Met. If, it's, uh, if you only feel, okay, only Upper East Side 
an upper west side can visit the Met in the same so, so that's another area of issue. Then we are, of course, uh, another challenge for us is, of course, we have to weather the storm of this economic challenge that we have, the economic challenge that we are facing uh, as a result of being closed and mm -hmm. of having very reduced audience until the end of the year. And I think we've, we put out these numbers. Uh, we've calculated that the loss that we are incurring between 100 and 150 million dollars. And that comes out of lost revenue, ticket sales and other revenue, but also no benefit galas that we can do and all this kind of thing. That's, uh, so, and we need to compensate for that. Um, and on the other hand, uh, we also project that in the next couple of years, our attendance and hence in some in certain way also our revenue will be way less than before because it's going to take a while till, for example, tourism picks up in New York City the same way as before. So what, what was a 7.4 million total visitorship will be probably reduced to five or, not, or even four million for quite some time. So we need to kind of adjust to that. And that also means looking at how we can uh, really uh, tighten our belt in all different areas. Um, on the other hand, uh, we also wanted to make sure that we have um, an environment that really uh, is as protective and as supportive of the staff as possible. So we uh, very early on announced we will pay everyone till uh, early July and we'll, 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 we'll reassess the institution. So I think our priority is really to uh, save and uh, make the staff safe and secure as long and as much as we can while we though battle this financial issue. And then, of course, we are now um, in the midst of almost like um, an urgent uh, re-evaluation, recalling and even like a learning phase about what have we done in regard to diversity equity mm -hmm. and inclusion and accessibility what were the plans that we put in place mm -hmm. <laughs> and realizing that they were certainly uh, um, not enough sometimes even flawed and uh, probably not even as well informed as they should be uh, and we're, we're using that right now as a moment to uh, move forward but, uh, but on, the, on the one hand you want to start with actions quickly on the other mm -hmm. hand I think you want to make sure that you communicate and be in touch with people about that as much as possible at a time. And then I'm going to stop. I'm sorry, this is kind of a long thing. No, no, no. But, but at a time, uh, at a time where communication is mm -hmm. so difficult, um, I think one of the challenges at the, uh, to, to kind of to end this is you have we have a staff of 2,400 people yeah. and another 400, 500 volunteers. Um, everybody sheltered at home at a time of great insecurity, uncertainty, uh, maybe even anger and, uh, and uh, frustration, shame, uh, all sorts of things, where usually we would like to convene and mm -hmm. be together. And yes, we are doing that virtually, like this call here, but an all staff meeting where you, you just project yourself as an image and you have 2,000 people watching you, is not the same as you have a full room and you feel the pulse of the institution. And we, have, we don't have a staff cafeteria, we don't have hallways where you just have a chat. So it's very hard to not only communicate, but also to feel the pulse. And on the other hand, also to create a, a feeling of community and being centered. Uh, and I think that's another challenge right now. So these are all thoughts that are going through my head when coming to work. Of course, mm -hmm. because normally my thoughts are, of course, fully focused on programming and what great things we need to do at the Met. Uh, but I think that's also something that's currently very relevant. Yeah, so you are both thinking short term and long term simultaneously, how to mediate all the situation all at once. And I'm sure we'll have a few questions in regard to that a little bit later, Max. I would like to say that having watched both of your message and Dan Wise, the president of the board of the museum, it's rather sol solemn, you know? It's solemn self-reflection rather than salutation because it is leading. Last April 13th was the Met supposed to be celebrating his 150th year anniversary. And so all of that is impending in this incredible situation that we all experience in but I was rather impressed how you were able to mobilize 
the staff from the textile conservation lab to produce masks for healthcare workers from the very get go. Um, so can you just share with us a little bit of that story because I, I, I was interested in dealing from that perspective also the creation of the mad stories which I like very much having watched a few of them already if not all so it, it's a kind of a emotional investment of the time it's not about brushing through things and covering things up you allow this emotional uh, response to be surf surface very visible so can you share with us some of that yes happy to so yes you're right I mean this is our 150th anniversary year which we have probably imagined to uh, go like work out very differently and so yes on the day of our anniversary we, we send a message and it was a message really of more like reflection and understanding the time we are in that was a moment on the like uh, 13th of April where we where, where people were dying and uh, dealing with the virus and uh, it was just uh, not a moment to celebrate but a, a moment to uh, really uh, show solidarity and try to find as much as many ways as possible to support uh, everyone who, who was dealing with this uh, with the crisis uh, right now. Um, I would also say that the Met is a very emotional place. Uh, like any other museum or any other cultural institution or like Brooklyn Whale, uh, people feel completely emotionally attached to not only what they're doing, but to, to why they're doing it and, and, and the community that they are embedded in. I would also say that um, also our visitors have a very emotional attachment to the Met. I think so you, said, you, you very kindly said at the beginning, the beloved Met. Um, and I think this kind of feeling of a beloved institution, certainly with flaws and everything, but it still mm -hmm. is, it's a home away from home. It's something that we gravitate towards, where we feel uh, it's, it's part of us and we are there as well. I think that's really important. So I, um, for us, this is, means not so much that the director says we need to help now uh, first responders or healthcare workers, um, but it's really staff thinking about how can we best help? How can we mm -hmm. be productive and active um, uh, in, in any, any moment in time? So I think at that time, it was really our textile conservators uh, saying, well, we, we want to do masks at home uh, for, for healthcare workers. And our conservation labs putting together all the uh, all, all equipment that could be helpful for hospitals uh, and uh, uh, that we, we we had available because of our vast laboratories that we also have at the Met. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think that the same is true even for some of the pro for sure some of the programming that we have, we've put forward. We noticed, of course, that schools well, cannot visit us anymore. And also that I would see school curriculums were challenged because they had to quickly pivot to digital uh, yeah. means and not every school, certainly, especially not, uh, not public schools in, in some cases were fully uh, equipped for that. So we quickly developed uh, uh, school programs, digital school programs that we made available for schools to, for arts and cultural education purposes. So we, we really tried to, uh, besides, so to say our longer term plans or, or what we are we're doing, really try to be uh, an active uh, member of the community and, and defining outreach, I would say, mm -hmm. in many different uh, ways. Um, uh, and I think that as an institution, you obviously also have a very important voice and responsibility in the cultural yes. discussion. And some of, sometimes we, we don't uh, use it maybe in the right way or we, our language is not appropriate. In other ways, I think our language and our voice is very important. I think it was important for the Met to close at that point. Um, as you know, different to maybe institutions in Europe where there was a clear mandate from, I don't know, the government or the, or, or, or the, the municipality. Uh, in the US, there wasn't, like every, we are, we are a private foundation on city, uh, on city premises, so we, we, we had to take this decision ourselves. So I think that there is an, there is an important responsibility that comes with uh, being a major cultural institution. 
Um, yeah, I like, I like the Matt, the, the Matt story, Max, for, for some of our uh, audience here who haven't seen it, I would invite you to see them. Um, one being a retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel, uh, whose name is Michael Jacquea, I think, or Jachia, who were wounded in the Second Battle of Fallujah. And, but he had studied the classic in college. You know, so he's able to identify Greek tragedies and this instant in the video, short video, he recalled Ajax the Great, you know, who returned home from the war only to kill 600 oxen because he thought they were Trojans. You know, he can relate to Ajax's story, neurological response and his own, own post-traumatic stress. Anything can be identified as a threat in combat because that's how he can sort of keep himself alive, you know? So it took spending, I think, quite a long time looking, going back and forth, and then he finally can relate to the broken sculpture and his own broken body. It was very moving. And I, the same, I, I would feel, I felt like the same with the, one of the, the uh, staff worker, I think, in what kind of department does he work in? Uh, uh, digital department. Right? Digital mm -hmm. department. Janita Petway, I think, right. a African American woman who identify also with Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man, through the text, beautiful Glenn Ligon, bold black text that always not that legible because of its uh, irregular bleed from the stenturing process. Uh, so it's, it's all is a variety of way to include that emotional. A so-called orchestration that I thought was very good. But let let let's uh, go to some images, be, knowing that Max don't have a lot of time. Catherine. But maybe maybe I can just sorry before we do that. Maybe I just can add one one thing to what you were saying. I think it's the Met stories are really important for us to do because I think it it really shows not only the connectivity of mm. different people, and we're obviously not surfacing. Uh, like prominent people per se, but really people who have very interesting connections to the Met and stories, and it shows the emotional connection, but it also shows, so to say, the, uh, what art can do and how art can uh, like connect with mm -hmm. people and how it opens up hor horizons and, and, and is part, part of that. What the other part that's also very important for me and that we've been uh, tackling ever since, I would say, I came to the Met, but, but of course already before, is that we also want to make sure that uh, people uh, and our visitors understand that um, artworks really also sit in a broader complex context with, uh, it, with social, political, historical context. So it's not just an aesthetic uh, phenomenon, but really a, a complex, sometimes even a gender that's connected with uh, with art and uh, with art making, but also with the usage of the object. Yes. And you can do that in various ways. Um, I think that our show on the Emperor Maximilian, for example, an important show on arms and armor was a, a, a typical example of that, where we showed basically that all the art that Maximilian was uh, commissioning, it was pure propaganda. It was really being used to foster me. So I think uh, it's really important also to show some of the the agendas uh, and some of the ways how, how art also can connect one in one time good and none other time bad with our current experiences and also our current life. So that I just wanted to kind of yeah, and, and you know, in one interview, Max, you 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 say that encyclopedic museum um, like the Met and others were founded on the idea to bring world culture together in one place and create one narrative, at, at least in one point. The, the, the idea arose out of the, the age of an enlightenment, for sure. You know, it's not that dissimilar to literal encyclopedia or the systematic dictionary of sciences, arts, and crafts, you know. To advance that, the, the, this kind of secularization of learning, so to speak, today contacts, you know, today contacts, the term globalization, or what you mentioned diversity early on, uh, can be read as an extension of the, that same idea. But, you know, we are going through, we experience the extreme fragility of that democracy. Uh, democracy. Absolutely. And, 
I think you're, yes, it's actually really encyclopedic museums like the Met, and it's probably the one, the prime example for that, were founded on this idea of the Enlightenment, yes, to bring the, the culture of the world to one place. And then we tended to tell one somewhat linear story of cultural development, starting in old Mesopotamia, going to, um, to Egypt, then to Greece, then to Rome, then to, and it was a very Western Eurocentric view. And it, the reality, of course, is that there is not this one story. There's not this, and there's certainly not a linear story, that there are, mm -hmm. there are multiple interconnected stories and actually different vantage points and perspectives. So the, the idea that there is this one narrative mm -hmm. is completely obsolete and it's, uh, it's actually a, uh, our challenge or our purpose is actually to complexify that and uh, to show that uh, this kind of multi-perspective attitude is really important. For me, one of the uh, most important like artworks, so to say, is always uh, Akira Kurosawa's uh, movie, Rashomon, where yeah. basically you have one, something happened, mm -hmm. or people tell the same, I mean, tell, tell what's happened, their stories are, are very different, but it's always the same thing, right? So in a certain way, it's really also depending on from what vantage point you look at it. And I think this multiplicity of an encyclopedic museum is really important these days, where it's really not only about uh, bringing the, the world to one place, but actually looking at art from, from these various uh, vantage points that we represent. By the way, the cheapest movie he ever made, and it was filmed in two weeks. That's right. <laughs> because to play in the courtyard. Um, <laughs> So, but Max, let's, can we go see a little bit more images here and sort of talk? So this is just to uh, show, this is of course how the Met looked like uh, before we had to close. And this is how it looks like now. So it basically tells, mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of a good image to seeing what we are missing. And I think that there's, while, while a museum is certainly active right now, and we are doing a lot of activities digitally and we are, a museum is not just a place that you visit, but it's really a task that is being performed in various ways. And it's an outreach and education and narratives and storytelling that we can perform outside of the institution. But of course, the, the center, the core is missing uh, right now. The ability to visit the Met and you see also how the, the Great Hall looks like without flowers, without, without uh, people. And uh, we're looking forward uh, to, yeah, at least inviting some uh, some audience back and uh, and creating that that again somewhat vibrant place and that's another issue that I, we are looking at right now. We want to make sure that the visit is secure and safe. On the other hand, we want to make sure that you don't feel as if you're coming to a danger zone yeah. or to uh, to something that uh, feels radioactive because of so many security protocols. It it still has to be uh, an emotionally positively recharging in experience, yeah. being at a museum, being together at a museum, and experiencing the art together. We, we, we must not lose that, even yeah. during our time uh, when the, no, well, without a vaccine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Catherine, can we move on the next? Yeah. This we can just move, let's uh, move on. So mm -hmm. I think that uh, what, you, what is interesting right now is that if you would come up to the Met right now, you would, and you, you would stand in front of the facade, it's the image that you saw just now, and then you would walk up. You see how, how we uh, really had contemporary artists in the last year um, further amplify, I would say, uh, not only the voice of the institution, but actually give more platform, uh, even unusual platform, but powerful platform to, to contemporary art and contemporary artists at the Met. Of course, Vangechi Mutu's sculptures on the facade of the Met are a prime example for that. And you speak, of course, also about a, a different uh, attitude and question also about how not only contemporary art is being uh, like further invited to the institution, but also what issues they, it can address and wh wh what it uh, pro projects. And maybe also the next uh, slide that you might have is, yeah, and then you come into the Great Hall right now and you would uh, see Kent Monkman's paintings uh, in the Great Hall. And I, I don't know if you have details of that, uh, but um, I think we do, yeah. Yeah, yeah so Kent Monkman is basically, again, a commissioned uh, work, uh, two works that we commissioned seem like Vangechimutu sculptures. And so Kent is in his works basically proposing a different kind of 
history painting, mm -hmm. different kind of history painting also about American history. And mm -hmm. in this case, of course, also about the suppression of indigenous people. And uh, maybe also the, the other slide is, uh, uh, and you can see that it, it is, a, I would say, a, a, these are great paintings. It's a very bold statement as well in the Great Hall. And it basically leads us already to looking at uh, how we can add and inject, I would say, additional narratives into an institution that has been built for the last 150 years and that for sure mm -hmm. has a certain narrative somewhat embedded in it. So I, I keep saying, when you go to the, to the American wing, mm -hmm. uh, you will see the great works of art, outstanding uh, uh, works of American art of the last uh, 300 years. Um, and it, it is also being used as a major teaching tool about American history. But mm -hmm. the issue is, of course, that, that this, a lot of the art tells only one kind of history, right? Yes. And it tells the history of the white settler, maybe mm -hmm. man, reaching manifest destiny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't really surface so much some of the other histories. So we need to, on the one hand, yes, inject some other histories, but we also need to make it more transparent that uh, even uh, a painting by um, Bierstadt or our church actually has a very biased perspective on, yes. on how America developed. So I think this is also an example of how, how artists uh, uh, that we invite kind of also sh show the way. And then I don't think we have an image for that, but then there's Ryan Tabe's installation in the, in the ancient Eastern uh, galleries deals with cultural heritage right now. And then, yes, the next slide could be used for, this is, a, again, an, a complete uh, reinstallation of certain parts of our collection that we just accomplished just before we had to close. So we opened it, I think, in late February, was another really important initiative that we had where we said, let's make sure that we break up some of the silos that we have in the institution about looking at art or, or how we display our collections in a like a, de a departmental way, which is, mm -hmm. of course is important and gives you deep understanding of certain areas, Greek and Roman sculptures, um, Egyptian art and um, African art. But on the other hand, uh, what we don't tell with that is that actually there are so many simul uh, like parallels and simultaneities and sometimes even cross currents between cultures. And so we, so we, we transformed one of the most prominent spaces of the museum, the so-called uh, um, medieval sculpture hall, yeah. um, in a into a different medieval sculpture hall. So we, we said, well, what if we don't define medieval only as European, but actually what we show what happened in medieval times in very different areas. So of course you have a, a Roman head, but you also have uh, works from from South America at the same time, from, uh, from Asia, uh, from, uh, from Africa. And, and it's, in that sense, it gives you a kind of a very different perspective of the, of the confluence of that. And we, we, we implement this as well as two other installations of that kind are already at the Met. And I hope when you will be able to come back to the to Met, you will see and appreciate that. I think it's a powerful gesture. And these are a bit like, I would call them even Trojan horses coming mm -hmm. into the Met because it will inform not only our thinking, but it will inform also further action that we're going to take about how, uh, how we can with, like, amplify our way of uh, presenting our collections. The Met, the Met is a vast area. I mean, we have 2 million objects and uh, 200, uh, I mean, 2 million uh, square feet uh, of space. So you can't turn a switch and just say, okay, here's Here's the next evolution of the Met, and uh, and, and let's and here it is. It's it's an evolutionary process. I would even argue that if we would build the Met again right now and mm -hmm. construct it, it would look very different, right? Yeah. Um, so in a certain way, we have this history of the Met, the history of collecting, the history also of philanthropy, and the history of priorities embedded in the physical footprint of the Met. And into a certain way, that's also part of our DNA, part of our history, and we can modulate that, amplify it, but you cannot completely uh, kind of dis disentangle it. Well, that's our greatest nobility and, and privilege. And you don't need to be a Buddhist to appreciate art from early Christian time. 
and you don't need to be a Catholic in order to appreciate Buddhist art, you know, or art from Buddhist time. Uh, What is this is part of that show? No, this is another um, um, It's another important installation. We we just again (laughs) just before we closed we reopened the British galleries and with a completely new narrative about British uh, decorative arts yeah. uh, and basically also addressing issues of colonialism and the question of high and low and wealth and poverty, slavery and uh, other elements that kind of helped, of course, uh, Great, Great Britain to become what it is and also uh, helped the production of a lot of these uh, fantastic objects, but also how it's intertwined with a market, with a level of exploitation and others. So I think it's, it is an, a very beautiful, very powerful highly charged also installation. Uh, this is only one image of a vitrine. This is a, it's a vast complex uh, in, at the Met uh, and, a, and a whole series of galleries that we've reopened. And I just, again, want to just invite uh, people who are, who are on this call today to just uh, check it out uh, when, when it's back up because it's really, uh, it is, it's a really, really important uh, installation. Again, an installation that will help us uh, also formulate different kind of installations also in other galleries uh, yeah. and other gallery complexes. Terrific. Next, Catherine. Yeah, and, and here's an example for that. So we are currently in the process of replanning and redesigning the so-called Rockefeller wing, uh, yeah. the wing that hosts our coll- collections of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas. And as you can see from this rendering, uh, the idea is, on the one hand, to make sure that uh, from a, this is a great design by Y Architecture, by Kula Part, and, uh, and uh, it's uh, to make a really outstanding, uh, very pristine environment, celebrate really the, these objects as outstanding works of art, um, but also to separate, I would see these different areas, the yeah. arts of Africa, the arts of Oceania, the arts of the Americas, that, that are kind of a bit more lumped together because of the logic of our collecting, because it all came as one gift from, uh, right. from the Rocker family. And then, so in a certain way, kind of dig deeper into the narratives, but on the other hand, also make sure that this, um, which was probably the, the one really almost like avant-garde moment yeah. uh, of yeah. the Met, when the Met as, a, as this big encyclopedic institution really absorb the arts of Africa and Oceania as important works of art um, and not so much in an ethnographic context, but really as important works of art on the same level as European paintings and others. So, so it's kind of a, a continuation of that spirit. So I think, it, and this is a rendering, and we'll hope to get going with this project uh, very soon. And, um, yeah. Can we see the next few slides, Catherine? So this is just to this is just to almost like commemorate a little bit uh, something that I feel, uh, of course, yeah, challenged uh, strictly a bit about uh, the Met Breuer and its programming has been, uh, I think, fantastic and really important also for the Met, and it really informed our contemporary the attitude that we have about contemporary art. It really de- developed our contemporary collection. It really mm-hmm. informed also our way of how to do exhibitions. It was a very successful laboratory. We are closing the, our, the Met Breuer, or we are leaving the Breuer building, and we are handing it over to the Frick collection, which will continue then to, uh, to program it. We will focus our contemporary activities at the Met Fifth Avenue building with some of, and you saw already some examples of that activity with a very strong also contemporary program at, um, and with uh, our ambition to uh, improve and expand our spaces for, for modern contemporary art. I, I'm a strong believer that in the long run, modern contemporary art needs to be part of the overall complex of the Met. So we shouldn't run a separate institution for modern contemporary art. Mm-hmm. But I think the Met Breuer really was a very successful uh, laboratory for, for us to do that. And it's a shame, I have to say, that because of the pandemic, uh, maybe next slide, uh, the really, uh, important uh, last show that we have there, the Gerhard Richter retrospective, uh, a certain kind of retrospective of his, of his work, um, which was developed, of course, in close collaboration with uh, the artist by Sheena Wagstaff and Benjamin Buchlo. Um, mm-hmm. 
it's an outstanding show, really powerful and very poetic, uh, very charged. Um, we, we were only up for nine days and uh, it's, uh, I think only very few people ha have really seen it um, and uh, we will not be able to reopen it. Um, uh, and it's, uh, wh while we have been able to postpone all the other shows that we had at the Met Fifth Avenue building, because here we need to leave the building, this show will live only maybe in memory of some, and we, we are doing a lot of program to, co to memorize it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to share this, uh, these images because I, it really, I mean, I, I'm feeling, this is, I'm, I'm looking at this with a heavy heart, let me put it this way. Yeah, we all feel that way, yeah. Max, but we also been very mindful of time. So let's move a few more before we open up for people. Yeah, Please that's good. Cool. Show. Okay. Yeah. So this is, Basically, and this is just on making the mat. Uh, let, let's skip that. I mean, if you want to open it up for questions, yeah. Wonderful. Um, Sophia, again, jumping in um, in order to facilitate the Q&A. Um, thank you both for such a generous conversation so far um, and for your attention to time. So first, we have a question from John. John, I will give you the permission to talk now. You should accept a prompt on your screen and you can take it away. Oh, hi, it's, it's John Hayward. Thank you so much. Max, what a, a wonderful presentation. And I, I felt that right before the pandemic, the Met was making such strides forward with Kent Monkman and with, uh, with everything else that was happening, the reinterpretation of the American Wing, the Diker Collection, all the good things that you're doing. There has been a tr tremendous criticism in some quarters, as I know you're aware of, uh, especially in, in uh, uh, for that for the culture critique, claiming that the Met is very discriminatory and uh, and elitist and whatever other labels, it's a very harsh time. I just wanted to get your perspectives on that uh, criticism of your of your institution and how we move forward from here, including some of the uh, very big challenges of having ample resources to run a large institution that's so important like the Met and the governance of the critique these days coming from the Whitney and other institutions, the critique and litmus test of board members and their affiliations with industries that might not be palatable to some people. So I'd love your perspective on that. Well, Thank I would you. say, I can answer that not only do we take this, or I take this critique very serious, I think it's also a really a, a moment not only to reflect on the institution and what we're doing and also how we, we can further improve in that uh, context. I think that there is, uh, we've made, made, I think, significant progress to diversify our programming, to diversify also parts of our contemporary collection uh, going more global. Um, I would say that we've made minor progress in uh, diversifying our staff um, and diversifying in that sense also the voices that are being heard and listened to in the institution. And that's something that we need to uh, address in a, in a, I would say, different way uh, to, so that the impact is being felt and also um, projected to, uh, forward. So, so we have to find, I mean, we are in the midst already of doing that, <laughs> finding, so to say, not only new strategies, but actually being uh, more proactive about it. I think also as an institution, but I have to see also for me personally, um, the last couple of weeks have been also a, a moment of really learning and understanding about how to be, and I might probably have not even kind of fully learned yet, but how to be really anti-racist in some of the things and not only non-racist. And I, I know we've all been dealing with that question uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks. And I think that, so in that sense, I would say that while we are, while some of the criticism of course comes with a fairly heated arguments and I would say sometimes also with a language that's uh, of course very strong, um, it is well meant and it's, uh, and it kind of, it, it, it points to uh, very substantial issues uh, that we will uh, continue uh, to address and need to address in, in a more vigorous and rigorous uh, way. Um, and we will have to be measured uh, by that. And then uh, we will also put forward uh, a more detailed uh, plan in regard to that in the next uh, weeks. But it's also really a question of 
uh, addressing the multitude of these uh, questions. So it's not only about programming, not only about collection building, it's really about representation of the institution on every level, board, uh, staff, volunteers, etc. Sophia. Hello. So the next question I will read on behalf of Brandon. Uh, layoffs are what contributes to vulnerability of largely black indigenous people of color staff. How are you thinking about balancing diversity within the economic crisis? And I know this is a tough one. Yeah, no, I think, so I, I have to say, and I said it at the beginning, uh, the, the Met's really uh, main priority during this crisis was that we, we, we are as supportive of our staff as possible. We have, as I said, we have a workforce that's way beyond 2,000 uh, people. And we, besides a one round of layoffs that we had to do uh, of 81 people um, uh, from, uh, from our retail area and front end, we've, we've continued to pay and keep up everyone uh, even, of course, staff members who simply cannot be productive right now, uh, as, as long as we can, and we, 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 we will continue to do that. But uh, it is right that we have to uh, reduce um, our, our staff looking at the, at, at, the, at the picture that's in front of us um, in, a, in a certain modest way. And, and we will do that in a thoughtful way, and it will um, affect um, not in an aggressive way, not, not in a radical way, but it will affect every part of the institution. Um, and uh, we, will certainly are, we are certainly mindful of the question of uh, diversity and, and, and how that affects, especially also the uh, people who are like, the most challenged during this time. That's ha this has been our guiding principle actually during this uh, crisis. So that's why we, we didn't furlough anyone. We didn't uh, want to go there. We wanted to uh, pay. And, and support as long as we can, and then also find very measured ways of how how to be uh, how, how to move forward. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have a question from Jeffrey Bishop. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to unmute you. You're um, live. Hi. Thanks hi. so much for this. This has been wonderful, and I, I think honestly this has been answered. But my question before you came to the subject was. Like many, so sad to see the Met uh, Breuer project closed down after an incredible string of, of phenomenal shows. And I'm one of the many who did not get to see the, uh, the Richter show. I'm kind of heartbroken about that. But how will the Met continue this strong curatorial effort that the Breuer space afforded um, your curatorial team? And um, Will that somehow force a, a, a rebalancing of what uh, is hung in a permanent uh, fashion in, from the modern collection to accommodate space for new uh, impressive shows in the tradition that you set at the Met uh, Breuer? Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, I can say yes to that. It basically means we will create some more spatial opportunities at the Met to, to put forward some of the program. I also would say the idea that modern and contemporary programming can only happen in a modern contemporary gallery area in the Met is wrong, right? I mean, it's, uh, we will have different levels of programming in different areas. And as we, as I showed with the slide, and as you know, even the facade of the Met, the Great Hall, et cetera, uh, unusual spaces or spaces that are not being programmed will, will be programmed as such. I would also say that it's really important to, if we stop defining modern art um, as only things that happened in Europe and in America, but if you look at modern art or at the time of modern art of, let's say, 1800 or 1850, you can have an art historical argument about that, till now, you would be surprised how much modern art is also in a lot of other of our galleries, in our African galleries, in our Asian galleries, etc. So you will see some of the programming or some of the thinking that we have put forward in the Met Royal to inform also other areas of the of the museum. Uh, but uh, it is, uh, and it will prioritize a certain amount of exhibitions, and that's what actually was the this part of the slide reel that we kind of just wasn't weren't able to uh, to um, comment on. So we'll have 
the, the Met will open with the Jacob Lawrence exhibition um, uh, uh, and the struggle series. We will have an Ellis Neal show coming up and a couple of other things. So, so it's uh, already the first couple of months will be very strong in regard to that. Great. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Um, we have time for just one more question before we move to the poem. So I am going to call on uh, Brian. Brian, you should be able to turn your mic on. Yes. Hello. Um, thank you so much for this. Um, from Northern Ireland, you can probably tell by the accent. Uh, I was recommended uh, this uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Rail um, chat by another Zoom event that I'm part of. Um, so I was just, my question is, um, after the pandemic, once we're all through this, to new or any or organization envisage the technological um, communication that's sort of strengthened through the pandemic going hand in hand with the physical events in your, in your galleries or museums or organizations? Yeah, happy to answer that. I think this is one of the biggest changes that we are experiencing right now. During this time of uh, closure and shelter at home, everyone has developed enormous new skills about how to disseminate digital information, but also how to receive digital information. Um, we, before, I think some of our digital tools or our offerings were more like for the younger generation or for this and that, this has completely dissolved. It, it, so for us, um, our digital channels, but actually our digital offerings uh, will, will reach a much wider audience and also all of the, the, the programs that we have developed during this time of closure will stay with us afterwards. So the museum has significantly expanded actually during this time of closure and that expansion will stay. And I think that will trigger also a lot of almost like hybrid uh, experience models about experiencing a, an exhibition or preparing for an exhibition already before you even come there uh, with, with, with certain digital tools, uh, uh, educational ways, and also having a, a much longer kind of almost like relationship, learning, education uh, beyond that. I think that there's a lot of uh, traction that we're getting from that and we are very focused on that. This is the closest I've ever got to the States, let alone the Met. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian, and for your willingness to speak up. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm very excited. Well, first of all, let me thank Max and Fong for a wonderful conversation. Thank Clearly, you. there's so much more we could talk about, and perhaps we'll have part two sometime in the future. Um, you've been very generous with your time and your willingness to answer all our questions. Um, I am so thrilled to introduce a special treat today, um, and that is Helen Lee, who will be our poet for the day. Uh, the Rail has a tradition of ending our events with a poem and our lunches. Um, Helen Lee is the chairperson for the American Foundation for the Courtauld Institute of Art. She is the Melkin Institution Advisor to the Arts and Culture Initiative, and she is also a board member of the Brooklyn Rail. Um, Helen, over to you. Great. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you. Thank you so much. Max and Fong, what a wonderful discussion. Lots of important and difficult topics. Um, I do hope we get a chance to do it again. It, that went by so quickly. So it, coincidentally, I've chosen a poem by a, um, a very famous North Irish poet by the name of Derek Mann. Shout out to Brian. It's always great to see the international participants to these discussions. Um, Derek Mann is an innovative Irish poet of the late 20th century, and his most prominent works are from the 60s and 70s. He's a voluntary exile from his native Belfast, who explores themes of isolation, loneliness, and alienation. Um, and I'm going to read a poem of his called, Everything is Going to Be All Right. How should I not be glad to contemplate clouds clearing beyond the dormer window and a high tide reflected on the ceiling. There will be dying, there will be dying, but there's no need to go into that now. The poems flow from the hand unbidden and the hidden source is the watchful heart. The sun rises in spite of everything 
in the far cities are beautiful and bright. I lie here in a riot of sunlight, watching the daybreak and the clouds flying. Everything is going to be all right. Beautiful. Thank you, thank you so much, Helen. Beautiful. Wonderful. And thank you everyone for being here and being part of this conversation. We hold these events every day, Monday through Friday at 1 p.m. And tomorrow we're thrilled to have Michael Armitage and Toby Kemp. So hope to see many of you there. And, oh, if you'd like to, uh, to turn on your mic to say goodbye, feel, feel free. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Vaughn. Thanks, Helen. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. 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 <laughs> Hi, Max. Hi, Max. Thanks to our editors. Hi, we love you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you, Amanda. I'm sorry we couldn't get to your question. Hey, hello. Bye, bye. Hi, Lynn. Bye, bye. bye everyone. Bye. Hey, Alan Villiers. Thanks so long. Thank you. Bye. Lots of love. Bye. Thanks, Paul. Bye. Thanks, Helen. Thank you, Helen. Bye, Phyllis. Thanks bye. to all the Met staff members who came. Bye. <laughs>